is Dr. Dave Nelson. Uh, this is our first of our online lectures. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. If you might need to turn your sound up a little bit more um, using a rather cheap mic. This is the first one I've ever done where I've recorded myself talking. So this is, to be honest with you, I'm sitting uh, in my home. <laughs> this is a little bit awkward. So I'm pretending to be in front of a classroom right now. So hopefully this will work for you. Uh, we'll, of course, have several of these online um, before we go and a couple after we get back. Today what I want to talk about is just simply Europe in the 1500s. Most of our class is going to be about Britain, the United States, but specifically Scotland. Obviously, this is a Scotland program. That's the main focus for our course. But today, I, I did feel the need to talk about Europe in general in the 1500s. Now, our class is going to go back before the 1500s. We are going to talk a little bit about the beginning of Scotland as a country. Um, there will be some videos online that we're going to watch. But most of what we talk about will be about 1500 and later up into the 1800s. So that's our core area a time period that we refer to as the early modern period. We're still in the modern period right now, but that early modern period is 1500 to 1800. So this is the start of that. What you see, hopefully see on the screen right now is a modern version of what Europe would have looked like uh, in the 1500s. And it's funny because the major powers at that time uh, wasn't what we would think of as today. In fact, England and definitely Scotland uh, definitely wouldn't have been the major powers before the 1500s. And Scotland won't be for quite a while. Talking about people in Europe, there were about 73 million people in what sometimes we call the West, which is basically Europe at that time. Today for the West, we might include Australia, Canada, the United States, maybe even Mexico, some people even include Japan in that. New Zealand is sometimes included in that. But for the West in 1500, that simply meant Europe. So again, about 73 million people in Europe, and that seems like quite a lot. But just to put it in some perspective, today, England has 40 million people. Scotland has 5 million people today. Wales, the other country in Great Britain, also has 5 million people. So 50 million people today live just in England alone. You know, so if you go back to the first map, you can see the size of England and think, well, you know, two-thirds of the people who lived in Europe lived in England today. Anyway, it seems like a lot, but it actually should have been more. Europe was just starting to recover from the effects of the Black Plague the Black Death that happened in the early 1300s. It was actually a series of events. There was massive flooding throughout Europe for about three years. It literally rained almost nonstop for three years, ruined crops. Then you had massive starvation. And then you got the bubonic plague that struck Europe. And it was really a series of waves of plagues that struck. But the, the, the initial one, the first three years, were the worst. This is a time when a third of Europe died. Half of England died. In fact, entire towns in England disappeared completely. The effects weren't quite as bad in Scotland as they were in England, but even Scotland felt quite a bit of that. And then we also are in a period we call the Little Ice Age. This is a period in European history, beginning around the time of the Black Plague, around 1200 and 1300, and lasting really until the 1800s, when Europe was genuinely colder than it had been. For instance, in England, which is pretty cool nowadays, they were known for their wine. We don't see wine in England anymore, because you need grapes to grow wine, and you need sunny, warm weather to grow wine. We don't see that in England today, but you used to before the 1200s. But in 1500, things get a little bit better. The plague is now over, obviously. P the population's starting to recover. And we're even seeing it begin to warm up. So the crops are getting a little bit better. So we're seeing the population rise a little bit by 1500. 
20 million in the Holy Roman Empire. The old joke is it wasn't Roman, it wasn't holy, and it wasn't an empire. Basically, think Germany. It's a little bit more than just Germany, but just think Germany today. So 20 million in the Holy Roman Empire. 15 million in France, 13 million in Italy, 8 million in Spain, uh, 4.5 million in Britain, which again includes Wales, England, Scotland. And I know this sounds a little bit weird, but there are about a million Jews. And the reason I want to point that out is because in later lectures, uh, that matters. Everyone in Europe at this time, mostly, will identify as Christian. And, that, that's, and they would all have been pretty much the same. Uh, there would have been some Muslims when you get into Eastern and Southern Europe. But throughout Europe, you would see these Jewish communities. And so it's estimated that there were about a million Jewish Europeans in 1500. The major powers were, as you can see, France, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire. England was starting to emerge as a major power, not quite there yet. Portugal, which gets forgotten about today, what we call the Papal States, in other words, the, you know, what the Pope control. Today we would think of that as Italy. And something that you may not think of, the Ottoman Empire, which is, think, a Muslim empire. Here we're thinking the south southeastern portions of Europe. Something we probably won't get a lot into uh, on this particular program, but just keep in mind that Muslims played a large role in European history, much more than many people today realize. Um, things like algebra come from Muslim scholars. A lot of our architecture comes from Muslim scholars. A lot of our mathematics comes from Muslim scholars. A lot of our astronomy come from Muslim scholars. Uh, when we get into the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, I probably will mention a little bit more of this, how much Muslim scholars played a role in this. We often sort of forget about that aspect of it. Although it doesn't play a huge role in Scottish history, however. Now what I'd like to start with, to get into life in the 1500s, is start with a fairy tale. And as some of you may recognize from the image on the screen, this is the story that we now know as Little Red Riding Hood. I'm going to read what is considered the earliest version of the story that, that we know. We know it goes back quite a ways. But this is the earliest version that we have. And this would have been very similar to the version that would have been told to people in the 1500s. This comes from a book by a historian named Robert Darton uh, that's called The Great Cat Massacre. Um, and, he, and he talks about some of these fairy tales. Anyway, here we go. Once a little girl was told by her mother to bring some bread and milk to her grandmother. As the girl was walking through the forest, a wolf came up to her and asked where she was going. To grandmother's house, she replied. Which path are you taking? The path of the pins or the path of the needles? The path of the needles, she said. So the wolf took the path of the pins and arrived first at the house. He killed grandmother, poured her blood into a bottle, and sliced her flesh onto a platter. Then he got into her nightclothes and waited in bed. Then time passed. And there was a knocking at the door. Come in, my dear. Hello, grandmother. I've brought you some bread and milk. Well, have something for yourself, my dear. There is meat and wine in the pantry. So the little girl ate what was offered. And as she did, a little cat said, Slut, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of your grandmother. But the girl didn't hear the cat. Then the wolf said, Undress and get into bed with me. Where shall I put my apron? Throw it on the fire. You won't need it anymore. And for each garment, bodice, skirt, petticoat, stockings, the girl asked the same question. And each time the wolf answered, Throw it on the fire. You won't need it anymore. 
When Earl got in bed, she said, Oh, grandmother, how hairy you are. It's to keep you warmer, my dear. Oh, grandmother, what big shoulders you have. It's for better carrying firewood, my dear. Oh, grandmother, what long nails you have. It's for scratching myself better, my dear. Oh, grandmother, what big teeth you have. It's for eating you better, my dear. And he ate her. The end. And again, that is, as far as we can tell, the original version of what we call Little Red Riding Hood. And as you may have noticed, there are some things missing. There's no huntsman to save the day. The story I remember hearing is that a huntsman came, cut the wolf's belly open, pulled out grandmother and Little Red Riding Hood and replaced them with rocks. And this is all while the wolf is sleeping. Sewed the wolf back up. The wolf woke up, felt terrible, fell into a river and drowned. Later versions, what they often tell today, is just that the huntsman came and saved them and everyone lived. There's also something else missing, something very obvious. Again, if you look at images of Little Red Riding Hood, of course, on the left on the screen is something from the 1930s, the WPA version of it. And then here's another classic version, the Red Riding Hood, which folklorists and psychologists and sociologists movie makers have made a big deal about. There's a lot of symbolism about the Red Riding Hood. Maybe it refers to blood. Maybe it refers to murder. A lot of people have made a big deal about the fact that Little Red Riding Hood may have been 12, 13. Maybe she's entering puberty. Maybe there's something Freudian about the blood. Maybe this is about sexual awakening, maturing of a young girl into womanhood. A lot of people see the wolf as representing loss of virginity, loss of innocence, manhood. And yet when you go back to the original story, like with so many fairy tales, there is no symbolism. There's no hidden message. It's up front. Do what your parents tell you or you die. <laughs> Stay on the trail. Don't get off the trail or something's going to eat you like a wolf. There's no hidden message. There's no hidden agenda here. You go off the trail, you talk to strangers, they're going to do terrible things to you. They're going to undress you. They're going to kill you. They're going to kill grandmother. That's the message. And so, oddly enough, when you go back to some of these early fairy tales, um, you learn a lot about life at that time. Just like today, you can look at horror films or action films or TV shows, and you can see what we, today in 2013, what we what we admire, what we desire, what we're afraid of. And that tells historians in the future a lot about you and I. You know, c popular culture, movies, TVs, books, stories, jokes, cuss words, um, urban legends, they reveal a lot about us. And so we can look at the same things in the 1500s. Sadly, there's no movies, no TV, no internet, no radio. And a lot of the books at that time, people didn't read because most people couldn't read at that time. But we can look at these folk tales, these stories that would have been told from one person to another that have survived to this day. Now, they're not perfect. Most of what we have today came from the people you see on the screen now, Charles Perrault from France and the Grimm brothers on the other side. Uh, they, of course, have cleaned up a lot of these stories over the years. But we can still sometimes go further back and find earlier versions of these. Other writers sometimes wrote these down. And again, we can begin to piece together what life was like to some, for, for regular people at that time. We can also look at paintings from that time period and drawings and do a little bit of this. Now, we're just going to do a touch of this today. We're not going to do a whole lot of this. It's really funny though, today a lot of times people study fairy tales and they study the versions from Perrault or from the Grimm brothers, the Grimm brothers from Germany. And they try to figure out, for instance, what Germans were like because the Grimm brothers told these stories. Well, the problem is a lot of these stories didn't start with the Grimm brothers. Um, 
In fact, take another story, the story of Cinderella, which most people know from Walt Disney. I mean, when I was a kid, this was my favorite Disney movie. I had a big crush on Cinderella as a kid. And it's a very sweet little story. The stepmother and the stepsisters are pretty cruel, but it's a pretty nice story about a young girl whose father has died, and her stepmother keeps her away, hidden away in their house, their mansion. She has to clean all the time like a maid, while the stepmother and her three stepsisters uh, get to enjoy all kinds of things, all the luxuries of life. Then there's a big royal ball that Prince Charming is throwing, inviting all the young maidens of the kingdom to come so he can meet them and maybe marry one of them. And Cinderella gets to go because a fairy godmother comes and provides her with a nice dress and a carriage. And she gets to go. She meets Prince Charming and he falls in love with her. But at midnight, she turns back into regular Cinderella. So she runs away right before midnight, leaving behind a glass slipper. And Prince Charming then goes around the kingdom, putting on the glass slipper, as though he can't remember what she looks like. That always confused me as a kid. But going around putting glass slippers in all these young women's shoes until finally Cinderella puts it on. They marry and live happily ever after. Now, that original story actually came from Perot, as, as we know it today. But he actually got it from his wife's nurse when she was a child she used to tell it to her wife his wife when she was a child it goes actually further back to Germany a woman named Jeanette who was a neighbor uh, of a friend of a friend of a friend so it actually this is originally a German story not a French story Little Red Riding Hood is actually a French story that the Grimm brothers tell. So, you know, these stories are being floating all over Europe. And we, you know, have to be careful of, of putting too much weight to them. But they still tell us a lot. Now, the original Cinderella story is actually a little bit different. It's almost the same. Uh, but it's a bit crueler at times. And in fact, when Prince Charming is going around trying to put this shoe on all these women's feet, uh, the stepsisters... Uh, one is too large, so she literally cuts her toes off and cuts her heels off. And so she's bleeding while she's trying to cram her foot into this glass slipper. So again, the original versions of these stories are much more sexual, much more violent, and much more blunt in their stories. There's, very, there's a lot less morals in these. Another example of one of these stories that we might know today from Walt Disney is the story of Sleeping Beauty. And again, this is a story of another uh, wicked stepmother who puts her daughter to sleep and uh, she pricks her finger on a, a spinning uh, wheel, falls asleep for a hundred years. Another Prince Charming comes, kisses her, she awakens and they live happily ever after. The original version is actually uh, much darker than that. Um, Prince Charming arrives. He's already married in the story. And when he discovers this beautiful sleeping woman, he rapes her without waking her up. She actually gives him several children, again, without waking up. And she only wakes up when one of her infants bites her on the breast as he is nursing. And then she wakes up from her slumber. Um, Cinderella, something else I forgot to mention in the story of Cinderella. Um, before her father dies, she has to hide away in the castle because her father is trying to molest her. So again, these stories present a very darker view of men, a very darker view of family life at that time. In one story, one that's not told anymore, a mother chops up her son and daughter and feeds the casserole to their father. These stories are full of incest, sodomy, cannibalism. I mean, this is a really... Bru uh, a brutal world at that time. Now, life in the 1500s wasn't always quite that bad. Um, as you can see in this painting uh, from the 1500s, there was a lot of celebration. When you look at this painting, one thing you notice that about life in the 1500s, and really life in the 1500s would have been pretty similar 
to life in the 1400s, 1300s, 1200s, 1100s. In many ways, for, for most Europeans, life was pretty much the same for centuries. Very little innovation, very few changes. It would have been the same over time. There was something unique about that, something almost appealing, this long sense of tradition this long sense of, uh, strong sense of community. There, there, um, this would have been a very oral society. Most people couldn't have read. Most people would not have written things. They would have told stories. They would, they would have talked to each other. They would have sang together. They would dance together. Uh, it would have been a fairly uneventful life. It would have been a very short life. So there's a strong need for releasing tensions lots of celebrations, most of these revolving around the church or revolving around agriculture. Um, so this would have been a very common sight throughout the year, uh, people dancing, celebrating, um, having, you know, again, a real strong sense of community because you kind of need everybody to survive. But again, you look at the life in 1500, then you come back in 1600, things are beginning to change. By 1700, things are changing drastically. By 1800, we're starting to see completely different people. Um, so from 1500 to 1800, we see massive changes, which is why we call it the early modern. But even looking at this painting, you know, we can begin to see what regular people might have looked like. People who do theater, people who do films, people who write novels know this, that if you want to see what people look like, a lot of times these paintings at least give us a hint of this. In a time with very few diaries or journals and, of course, no photographs, this is all we have. And so we can see that the, 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 the headwear, the clothing, uh, the pants, and, and the way men dress versus the way women dress. And this is a time period where your clothing was incredibly important. Uh, for instance, in England, you couldn't wear certain colors if you were just a commoner or a peasant. Only landowners could wear certain colors. Only um, priests could wear certain colors. Only royalty could wear certain colors. So even the way you dressed told a lot about who you were, um, where your status was in society. I also like this painting, which is a very different painting. Uh, this gets back to sort of the fairy tales a little bit. This is uh, uh, Bruegel's Triumph of Death in 1562. Today, you can find this in Madrid, Spain. J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, this is always his favorite painting. And he thought, for him, it, it sort of was a, an early version of what nuclear war might look like. It's almost a laundry list of all the different ways you could die. And it was, you know, kind of a vision of hell. And if you look at it very closely to the bottom right, um, a lot of people almost see visions of the Holocaust, these people being shoved into this box uh, by, the, by these demons almost. Um, life was not this bad, obviously. But it is a reminder that death was always very close to people. This is a world where you would have seen people die. You would have buried people often your children, you would have buried your spouse, you definitely would have buried your parents. And you would have done it, picking up their bodies, unclothing them, washing their bodies, literally digging the grave, maybe making the coffin, lowering the grave. You know, today we're so removed from death, you know, except for maybe military or hospital workers or emergency workers. Most of us don't see death on a daily basis. They would have at this time. And this, this, this painting is a reminder of that, um, even if it's an extreme reminder. As a historian, it's funny, people often talk about the past as the good old days, especially when you're talking about the U.S. There's always the sense that things were better in the past. This is a, a real fallacy, um, that there was such a thing as a good old days. And as a historian, I always tell you, that even though there might have been things about the past that could have been better. Um, again, that sense of community. Sometimes I wish we had more of that today. Uh, this is from somebody who doesn't even know the names of their neighbors. But um, I will tell you as a historian, we are in the good old days. Things are better today than they ever have been. A crime's actually lower than it used to be. We live longer than we've ever lived before. 
even when you look at those magazine covers and you watch those news articles on TV about how terrible we are and how horrible our food is, processed food, and you know, and how we're all too fat nowadays, and and all that. And there's bits and pieces of truth to some of that. But the reality is. We are healthier today than we ever have been. We eat better than we ever have been. You and I get to do something that people in the 15, 16, 1700s never got to do. We get to feel full. Heck, we get to be overweight. People back then weren't always overweight. Um, people felt hunger more than they felt being full. You ate just enough to stay alive. Today, you know, we can... We can overeat. We have the luxury to overeat. We could go to a buffet and go, oh, I'm done. I'm full. That wasn't, a, that wasn't an option for most people back then. Um, we get to, you know, meet our grandparents. In some cases, our great-grandparents. Or we might get to see our great-grandkids one day. That, that was not an option for most people back then. Very often, you didn't even get to meet your grandparents. You probably never saw your grandkids in many cases. As you can see, the statistics on the screen give you a sense of this. 25% of all babies would die before their first year. 50% would die before you're 30 years old. 90% of all Europeans died before they were 60 years old. You would have been very old if you actually made it to 60. France, where things always seem to be worse. In the 1700s, this is after the scientific revolution, after the Enlightenment. 45% of French people would die before they were 10 years old. That's an astonishing statistic. Most people married, oddly enough, in their mid-20s, even though we always think of Romeo and Juliet and people marrying at 13 years old. Uh, you could, and women could marry at 12 or 13 or 14, and it did happen. But most people actually married in their mid-20s. Um, only the elite generally married young, and that was to secure those dynasties and, and, and all that. Um, the average age was 27 for men and 25 for women when they got married. Um, your average age would, would have been about, you know, as far as your lifespan, would have been between 30 and 40 years old. And that 40, uh, you would have looked old, very old, much older than I'm 41, and they would have looked a lot older than I look today, uh, not that I look young. Um, for women, though, and that, that's really more for men. Uh, for women, it was often uh, average lifespan was between really about 25 and 35. Uh, and that the difference is because of childbirth, which is still one of the most dangerous things humans do. Uh, even though plenty of people give birth without modern medicine, and we are beginning to learn that some of what we do with childbirth we don't need to do. Um, but for instance, uh, my spouse, uh, my wife, gave birth uh, seven years ago. And, you know, there's no real problems. Um, but, you know, there were indeed a few little complications. As, as people might say, there was ripping and tearing and a little bit of bleeding. And, you know, she took some penicillin and she was over with. And it's something you don't even talk about. It's just, a, you know, part of the process. Um, she was in pain for a couple of weeks, you know, sore and, um, you know, no lasting after effects. She would have died if it was 1500. She would have died. So many women who give birth today, if they had given birth in 1500, would have died of infection, of blood loss, of not being able to be healed, because the medicine just simply wasn't there. So uh, often if, for instance, there are problems where the child can't come out because maybe they're turned the wrong way or the umbilical cord is ripped or, uh, wrapped around their neck, uh, and they would have been, say, uh, cut out, a cesarean section, which is how I was born, um, they would have done that back then. But the woman would have died. She would not have survived that. The idea is, okay, let's get that baby out of there. So life for women was very, very harsh back then. And we're going to talk more about that uh, in a few moments. Now, just to give you a sense of, of when you saw people, what they would have looked like, your average man uh, would have been just barely five feet four, um, probably weighed, you know, an average 130, 135 pounds. Uh, you are what you eat. And, you know, it's very common for us today to be, 
five ten, six feet, six two, six three. Somebody six feet or higher would have been a giant at the time. When old fairy tales talk about giants, uh, they might have been talking about people who may have been six five, six six. Because we are what we eat, and the types of diets we eat today um, makes us more robust. For instance, we can see this in Japan. Japan, in the 1920s, people would have been average about 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five for uh, men and women. Uh, after World War II, they were introduced to a European Western-style diet, more beef, more corn, more carbs. And now in Japan, you meet a lot of people who are 6 feet tall, 6 feet 1, 6 feet 2. Not everybody, of course, but a lot more. And that's just simply a change in diet. So a lot of this is about food, uh, the harshness of their lives. A lot of these men would have been hunched over with horrible backs because of carrying things on their backs, no modern transportation, for instance. Women would have been even shorter and lighter than the men would have been at that time. Something else, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, death penalty would have been a very common thing for hundreds of crimes, not just murder and rape and blasphemy, but also for things like stealing or doing something that you're not supposed to do on the wrong day. In Scotland, and we'll talk about this when we're in Scotland, this was especially the case. Scotland was a very, very harsh society when it came to crime and punishment. And again, something else that seems shocking to us today, but murder was twice as common then as it is today. Uh, that, that seems to go against our idea that, uh, that these would have been the good old days. Now, for most people, life in the 15 and 1600s would have been short, as we've described, again, for women, under 35, for most men, under 40, uh, for a lot of people, much younger than that. It would have been rural. Most people would have lived in small, little villages. Most people would have lived and died within five miles. That's it. That, that would have been their entire world. Would have been maybe a five-mile radius. That's why in Little Red Riding Hood, when she's walking down the trail, and, you know, and she's being told, do not leave the trail, that was a reality for people. There weren't many roads back then. Most of the roads that were still around in the 1500s go back to Roman times. So these roads are over a thousand years old. Uh, most of these roads are just little paths, literally through the woods. There would have been very few maps. You would have had no real sense of the world outside your village. So if you would have walked, say, a mile away from your village through the path, and then you stepped off the path for a few feet, you really would have been lost. You really wouldn't have known where you are. The woods were a dangerous place. They were seen as satanic, dangerous, where monsters live, where, where horrible animals live, because that was reality. You really didn't know anything about those woods, and you didn't want to know. Um, so it was a very, a, a very simple life. Um, and again, living in a very small village, which is, again, what most people would have lived in. Most of these villages would have been 100 people or less. And these villages would have been about 15 to 20 miles apart. In, some, in England, maybe a little bit closer even. And even today, if you drive through England, not so much Scotland, but England, and it is true, about every 5 to 10 miles, you hit another little town, another little town, another little town. Um, that was about as far as people could walk, you know. Uh, you didn't go much further than that, and a lot of times they were even much closer than that. And then between these villages, again, would have been very... Uh, thick woods. And by and large, these villages would have been isolated and, and pretty much separate from the rest of the world. Um, these areas would have been communal. You would have had, again, as we talked about earlier, you, you would have depended on your neighbors. Uh, farming would have depended on that, and we'll talk about that in a moment. This is a violent world. You can see that in the fairy tales. Uh, in a way, you could say this is an Old Testament world. This is a lot about eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This is very much about punishment, um, you, know, uh, you know, swift punishment. Um, and again, when you're surrounded by so much death, it may not be quite surprising uh, that people were a little quicker to settle disputes often with violence. Uh, because it wasn't such a nice life, um, Abandoning of children is very common. Again, there's a reason why in those fairy tales there's all these stepmothers, because women were dying very often. For most men, you might have had two to three wives before you died. Most marriages were between six to eight years because of childbirth. 
uh, the dangers of childbirth. Um, ma abandoning of children, sadly, was very common at that time. You see that in a lot of the fairy tales. By the way, I want to mention this very quickly. Some people think that people didn't love their children as much back then because it was so harsh, and that's actually not true. Uh, just like us today, the loss of these children would have been horrendous for these people. So you might have given birth four, five, six times, but only half of them might have actually lived beyond a year or ten years. And so this would also have been in some ways a very sad life for people. This would have been a Christian society. Well, I'll say this again later. Everybody would have been Christian, uh, with very few exceptions. You would, you know, again, we would see some Jewish neighborhoods, which in Italy were called ghettos. That's where that word comes from. Uh, you get into Southern Europe, you do see some Muslims, but by and large, you would have been Christian. And you wouldn't even have called yourself Christian. It would just have been assumed that you were Christian. And you would all belong basically to the same church, the Catholic Church, the universal church. That's going to change in the 1500s. You would also have been incredibly superstitious. And we'll talk more about this later, especially when we get into the witch trials. Because this is how you would explain the world. This would not have been a world of modern science. That didn't exist yet. You weren't dumb. A lot of people say people back then were stupid. They were. That's not true at all. Their world made sense to them. Their superstitions made sense to them at the time. And it turns out a lot of their folk remedies really were quite accurate, but not for the reasons they said, it turns out. For instance, we had vaccinations today. Um, the first vaccination was for smallpox, and it was used cowpox to do that with. People in the countryside knew that going back to the 13 and 1400s. They didn't know why, but they knew that if you got cowpox, you, were, you wouldn't get smallpox. So they were vaccinating themselves by purposely giving themselves cowpox 300 years before modern vaccinations. So even though they were very superstitious at the same time, they weren't dumb. They were just simply ignorant of modern science. So superstitions, magic even, was often the way they explained the world and survived the world. Malnourished, I don't think I need to say too much about that. They simply weren't eating enough. Very agricultural. Uh, depending on where you are, at least 80% of all Europeans farmed. And for most areas, including Scotland, it would have been closer to about 95% of everybody farmed. Again, isolated and smelly. I mean, from an olfactory uh, position, uh, this is the thing you don't get through documents, paintings, movies, lectures is the taste and smells of this time period. The food would have been very bland. There would have been very little spices for most people. And the smells would have been very common. This is an age uh, uncommon for us today. This would have been an age of no modern sewage. I mean, people would have just gone to the bathroom uh, in buckets and dumped them out the windows in the middle of streets of cities. Uh, often use that human sewage to, to fertilize their fields. So truly, there truly is a cycle going on here. You eat it, you defecate it, you fertilize your food, and you eat it again. Um, it's something they call midnight soil at that time. Uh, dead animals, dead bodies in certain cases. Um, nobody had perfume. I mean, the old there's an old joke that a peasant went to Paris and smell perfume for the first time and fainted, and it could only be revived if they put some manure under their nose. Oh, that's familiar smelling, and then they woke up. Um, most people would not have taken baths back then. Baths were seen as unclean, that you needed that protective layer of dirt. Uh, some people may know the story of St. Thomas a Becket, who refused uh, to do the king's bidding uh, King Henry II of England. And so he was whipped and eventually killed for disobeying the king. And when they took his shirt off uh, to whip him, the shirt literally stuck to his back because he hadn't taken his shirt off in a couple of years. And, 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 and he was full of filth, and they even described bugs as crawling along his back. And he was one of the elite. Um, these are, again, people with no uh, perfume, no deodorant. Um, so again, even though they would have been used to it, to us today, it, it is quite shocking. Uh, for kings and, and, and royalty, when they went to the countryside, it was very common for them to carry flowers or maybe even an orange uh, under their nose so they could smell that instead of smelling the reality of life back then. Again, I'm trying to give you a pretty honest 
uh, view of what European life was genuinely like at this time. We often talk about, you know, old mother Hubbard with no food in the cupboard. Uh, again, a another example of a fairy tale describing uh, the reality of life back then. Speaking of superstitions and just how odd of much of this world is to us today, for instance, um, I mentioned that the, where I got the fairy tale from was a book called The Great Cat Massacre. Um, that was reality of life back then. People uh, didn't think of the animals, for instance, as being um, uh, things that we need to care about. Uh, this is a, a, an etching called The First Stage of Cruelty, and this is uh, uh, based on real life stuff. For instance, cats. Cats were very much feared. This had to do with superstitions and such. There's a reason why they're, they're, they're linked with witches. And again, we'll talk why later. But it was very common for communities often to round up all the cats and put them in big sacks and then burn them and celebrate and cheer and sing as you were burning these cats. It was a wonderful celebration to people that today we think is horrible. Here you have images of dogs being held up uh, by their hind legs and being beat, being castrated and, and being prodded uh, with sticks inside their bodies, all kinds of horrible things. And, you know, this is in many ways what people were like back then when it came to animals and even each other a little bit. Um, it was a much harsher world. Speaking of what, how most people would have lived at that time, again, and this would also have applied to Scotland as well. Most of these homes would have been something that we call wattle and daub, which is basically sort of clay over reeds and sticks to, you know, as a mold. Most of these would have been uh, thatched roofed. Your basic peasant house would have been about 15 feet wide, maybe twice the length. Um, as we get a little bit closer to the 1500s, they might have been a little bit bigger. Um, there would have been a big dung heap in the front yard for soil, and also that's just where you would have put all your sewage at until you needed it. Uh, your barn, this is what I think really gets strange to us today. Your barn and your home were the same thing. So the animals, you wouldn't have had many if you had any. But the cow, the horse, the pigs, the chickens all would have lived in the home. They would have been roaming around outside during, today, during the day. But at night, you all would have lived inside the same place. In some cases, it might have been a big pile of hay. You all would have laid on that. Um, and you would have kept each other warm. And so you would have these animals all night. You would have your parents who may be having sex to have another child, and you would have been right there beside them. Um, again, very odd. No sense of privacy back then. For instance, in the summer, when it does actually get hot in Europe, you know, it was very common for people to plow fields naked. Uh, people would have gone to the bathroom, often right in front of you. Especially if you go to big cities, it would have been a very common sight to just see someone defecating right in the middle of the street. Uh, or urinating, you know. So again, a lot of the sense of that privacy that we have today just simply didn't exist back then. And, and these kind of sleeping arrangements, um, children being smothered in the middle of the night also, sadly, was uh, a very common experience. These floors would have been dirt or clay. Um, you know, these piles of straw or hay would have been full of bugs and vermin. Uh, and the, by the way, this is uh, th these are the peasants who are doing pretty good. You know, it was much worse for other people. Um, I mean, some cabins didn't even have a chimney. You start a fire and it just smokes up the house. You open up the door and there you go. A lot of these places didn't have windows. Uh, very few of these would have had glass. So the window literally would have just been a hole in the wall. And then you might have had shutters to close it out um, at night. Most of these people, again, um, wouldn't have had last names. They're, you know, you would know them as Dave, Dave the Carpenter, or Dave, son of Nell, which is probably where I get my name from, David Nelson. Um, one of my ancestors would have been the son of somebody named Nell. Uh, that's why we have names today like Carpenter or Smith or Cooper. You are Frank the Cooper, Frank the person who builds barrels. So most people would just simply known you by your first name and maybe you know, what village you're from. Ideas of time was not a strong concept. This is a world without calendars, without clocks. It would have been seasonal, winter, summer, spring, fall. One of the reasons for all those celebrations, that was to help to mark time, time to harvest, 
a time to give thanks, time to plant the seed. You would have noticed how long and short the days were, winter solstice, summer solstice. Uh, those would have mattered, the equinoxes. Um, but generally speaking, you wouldn't have thought of what time it was. It's sun's up, time to get up. Sun is down, time to go to bed. Um, so your day would change uh, depending on what time of year it is. For instance, in Scotland, when we're there in May, uh, the sun will come up about 5 a.m., and it'll go down about 9 p.m. If we were there in December, the sun would come up about 8.30 a.m. and go down about 3 p.m. So your days would have been extremely short in Northern Europe in the winter and extremely long in the summer. In fact, if you're in England or Scotland in, say, July, uh, it's only truly nighttime for about five hours. Uh, even 11 o'clock at night, it still has that dusky look. And again, by 4 a.m., that sun is up. Um, and that would have been your day back then. When you talk about the smells of the time, again, um, most of your candles that you would have used would have probably used tallow, which is basically fat and grease. And it gives off a horrendous smell. I mean, it just smells like rotten, something rotten. And so that would also have been something that you would have encountered at this time. Here's another shot of uh, of some of these peasant homes. And by the way, I'm describing it very horrendously from a modern perspective. But at the time, this would have just been home. This would have been your life. And you would still have found all kinds of ways to have pleasure through stories, through love, through music, through dancing. But from a modern perspective, uh, let's not mistake that these, again, were the good old days or a uh, lot of room for improvement. And again, some of these paintings are coming from the late 1700s and early 1800s. So for the poorest of the poor, uh, life really didn't even change uh, even as much uh, as, as we think of today. I mean, you know, for a lot of these people, life uh, continued on the same path for a while. Again, another painting of celebrations. This is from the late 1600s, and you can get a sense of the clothing, the communal sense, uh, the music. You have a, a very primitive bagpipe here. As for food, um, again, dietary needs were not being met. Uh, diet was very poor for most people, and even for the rich. Um, and it's funny, we, we can actually, in the same way in the U.S., we can divide the country up between, say, uh, those that drink sweet tea, and then if you go further north, you don't get sweet tea anymore. So there's a sweet tea line. There's a grits line. You know, you go so far north or west, people don't eat grits anymore. Uh, I grew up eating boiled peanuts, and I didn't realize that there's a boiled peanut line. You get up even to places like Arkansas, and people don't do boiled peanuts there. In Europe, we can we can see the same thing. For instance, there's a beer wine line, at least back then. In other words, if you lived in Scotland, you lived in England, Germany, you were going to drink mostly beer. And by the way, you wouldn't have drank water back then. Water would have been dangerous. Um, it would have been. They would have known this. They just know you drink water, you die, you get sick. Um, but we now know they would have been full of all types of horrible microbes, and it would have been very dangerous. In fact, one of the greatest things that happened to Scotland was the introduction of coffee and tea, because you boil the water before you put the stuff in it, and therefore it kills all the germs and bacteria. And so suddenly thousands of lives are being saved just simply by boi boiling. Back then, most people would have drank alcohol. Uh, uh, maybe a little milk, but of course no refrigeration, so milk won't last very long. But alcohol would have been very common from kids, three, four years old, all the way up until you died. Uh, you would have drank beer for most of your meals in Northern Europe. In Southern Europe, you would have drank wine. Another line would have been a butter or olive oil line. Scotland, England, Germany, most of France, you would have cooked and ate with butter. Uh, if you lived in southern France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, you would have cooked and ate with olive oil. And even today, you still see that very much. Uh, we won't see a lot of olive oil, for instance, in Scotland. You'll see a lot of people drink beer. Not as many people drink wine, although they, of course, do. Um, but again, the types of food you would have eaten would have been mostly meat. Meat and bread. bread wheat was the number one crop in Europe. So a lot of bread uh, and a lot of meat. Um, now, if you were very poor, you may not have gotten much meat at all. It would have been a lot of bread. 
um, the better off you are, the more meat you had. If you were royalty, it was almost all meat that you would have eaten. Meat was seen as a luxury. And deer was royally protected in much of Europe, and that definitely was the case in both Scotland and England. That was what royalty got to eat. If you remember the old story of Robin Hood, uh, right at the beginning of the story, Robin Hood gets mad because a peasant gets punished for killing one of the king's deer, and Robin Hood gets very mad about that. Um, so for the royalty, scurvy, loose teeth would have been a very common problem. Something else that the poor would have eaten would have been porridge. Uh, this is still a big thing in Scotland today, by the way, which is basically water and bread mixed together. And specifically in Scotland, oatmeal, which is still the case, oatmeal would have been a big thing to have eaten. Uh, vegetables were really seen as something animals ate. You would have eaten onions and maybe cabbage uh, in, in Scotland, um, but you wouldn't eat maybe a few carrots occasionally. But, but that was seen as a last resort because, that's, again, that's why that, that was how animals ate. But when you were poor, you often ate more than if you were rich as far as vegetables. Really very few fruits available. But some of the, some of the vegetables you could have gotten in Scotland would have been cabbages, uh, beets, uh, mushrooms, uh, cucumbers, um, again, oats, wheat. Um, those are the kind of things you would have eaten at that time. And when you did eat, you wouldn't have used... Um, Forks. Forks were from Italy. They hadn't made their way to Scotland at this point. It pretty much would have been your hands and a knife. Um, I mean, you, you would have had this, again, very intimate relationship with your food. You would have picked your bowl up and drank right out of the bowl, probably no spoons. Um, you would have long sleeves, and a lot of that was so you could wipe your mouth or blow your nose on your sleeve. I mean, that was part of part of the purpose of having these very long sleeves. Um switch sides here and again here's a, a later painting uh, that that's from the kitchen of well-off and again you can see a lot more variety here but you also notice that it is mostly meat I mean this is this is what a meal would have consisted a lot of would have been a lot of meat and then some bread and then maybe some type of dessert uh, what they in England and Scotland still sometimes call pudding which is just means dessert <coughs> excuse me oh by the way I need to talk a little bit about agriculture I'll um, you basically would have had three good years and one bad year. Uh, very primitive tools for most people. It, go, going back to Roman times, really, a hand plows. Um, for every seed that you would have planted, you might have got a yield of about five grains, which is terrible. Today, one seed to about 30 grains. Uh, even at that time, Chinese agriculture was five times more effective than it was in Europe. You would have followed a crop rotation. You probably had a field that you would all shared, a big common field, and then you would have divided up probably into four plots, and one field would have been kept fallow, meaning no crops would have been grown. You would have rotated that every year. So you wouldn't own your own land for the most part. You would have taken your animals out, and they would have fed on that common area, and you would have farmed. Uh, on this common area. And of course, a lot of the, what you would have grown would have been taxed by the government and tithed uh, to the local church. So in fact, they, they took the vast majority of what was grown would actually gone to both the church and the government at that time. So for the remainder of this lecture, which is actually from another lecture that I give. I, I put two together, so there's a little bit of repetition here, and I apologize for that. Um, what we'd like to talk about is, now that we've kind of given an overview of life in the 1500s, for most people, we haven't really talked about kings and, and the church yet, I'd like now to talk a little bit more about European society in 1500, and we're building up to something. As we'll see, the, the life actually gets a little bit worse for people in the early 1500s, and that leads to some major changes. So again, a, a quick overview, once again, of, uh, of European society, and this applies to Scotland as well. It's Christian, it's, it's overwhelmingly agricultural. Your identity, if you went to somebody, say, uh, Berwick, North Berwick in Scotland, a, a small town outside of Edinburgh, or even just Edinburgh, or Leith, and you know, I'm trying to think, name some cities in Scotland, and you said, who are you? If you said that to somebody today, uh, think about all the ways we identify ourselves today. You would give your name. I'm David Nelson. Uh, you might say, you know, I'm an American. Uh, I'm a Floridian, because I, I actually live just outside of Georgia. I'm a Floridian. I'm a resident of Tallahassee. 
Um, I am white. We, we might identify ourselves from a racial viewpoint. You might identify yourself as your religion. I'm Christian, or I'm atheist, or I'm agnostic, or I'm Hindu, or I'm Jewish. You might identify yourselves by your politics. I'm a Democrat, or I'm a Republican. I'm liberal. I'm conservative. I'm a libertarian. You might identify yourself by your job. I'm a historian. I'm a professor. Or I'm a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. I'm a housewife. I'm a house husband. Um, maybe identify yourself by whether you're married or not. And this is something we still see in our society today, especially with women, miss or missus. Uh, so that's part of often one's identity. Back then, identity was, was much different in most of Europe. Again, no last names, it would just being your first name. You would identify more with your town or village. And you know, you think of, we're in 2013, this is the 500th anniversary of Ponce de Leon discovering the new world, just naming La Florida. So his name is Ponce of the kingdom of Leon. So you would identify yourself by your village or and or your king or kingdom. I am Dave, I serve King Mary, or excuse me, Queen Mary. And your status, are you a peasant? Are you a commoner? Are you a priest? Are you a king? Are you a landowner? Are you a lord? That would have been incredibly important. As I said earlier, even the way you dressed would have given that off. You would not identify yourself as Scottish or English or French or German. You would identify your religion, unless perhaps you were Jewish or Muslim, because it would just been assumed you're Christian. And your race, the concept of race wasn't developed yet. And everyone pretty much looked the same. Uh, it wouldn't be till the New Worlds discovered, Africa and the Americas, that suddenly ideas of race began to develop. So we're not there yet. Let me, I'm gonna skip the great chain of being just for a moment and go down to the high death rate. I think we've made this pretty clear. This is a, this is a tough life for people. It is a patriarchal society. And of course that means basically, as James Brown once sang back in the 1960s, it's a man's world. This is not a matriarchal society, this is a patriarchal society. Um, from God, to kings, to lords, to priests, to the landowners, to your husband and father, the men ran and we do see this sadly throughout human history. But in European society, a Christian society, this goes back to a particular interpretation of the Old Testament, specifically the story of the Garden of Eden. Adam was created first, Eve is created later from one of Adam's ribs. They live in peace, they're naked, they're living wonderful lives, they don't have any worries, there's no death, there's no sin, everything's wonderful. But the one thing they can't do is eat from the tree of wisdom. It doesn't actually say an apple. It just says you can't eat from the tree of wisdom, the fruits from that tree. And then one day, a serpent. It doesn't actually say the devil, but most people interpret it as the devil. It goes up to Eve and tempts her, eat some of this fruit. And she does. And then she gives it to Adam, who says, okay, and eats it. And then God comes and basically says, okay, everyone out of the pool, you got to leave, you're out of here, put your clothes on and go. And that's the fall of man, the beginning of original sin. We now know the difference between good and evil. We now have mortality. Soon we'll see murder, we see horrible things. And the way some people interpret that story, especially back then, is that it's the woman's fault. That Eve is evil. That women are less moral than men. They are the weaker sex and that they are the ones that are the problem. Even though there was love and respect for women on one hand, there was also this other side to European society, that women are subservient to men, that women have painful childbirths because of this, that women have their monthly curse, their menstrual cycle because of this. And it's also, I think, and many sociologists and historians say the same thing. I think there's also something else at work here. I think in a pre-scientific world, there is a fear of women that has to do with childbirth, the mystery of females with their menstrual cycles, with the idea that they bring life to earth. And I think there is a power there that men at that time didn't understand and feared and used religion to justify that fear. 
But it is an odd world today. Women often weren't allowed in churches soon after giving birth. There's a reason why babies were baptized at an early age. Uh, some of that was because they were going to die soon. Some of that also was this idea, at least some people believe, to bless the baby who have been inside of their mother for so long, that they need to be cleansed, if you will, because of that. So it's a truly patriarchal world. And this will play a role in, our, in Scotland when we talk about things like the Protestant Reformation and the witch trials. But that great chain of being, this, this is an example of it from a textbook from the 1500s, where you can literally see the chain right in the middle. At the very top, there is God sitting on his throne. In Europe in the 1500s, their view of God was of a king. And Jesus, of course, the king of kings. Um, that's not how all Christians looked at God and Jesus, but that's how Europeans looked at him. He sits on his throne in the way our kings sit today, surrounded by his angels. Um, and, and, and then you have the kings below him, and then the priests and the church, and then the lords and the landowners, and then your peasants and your beggars, and then the animals, and then the plants, and then the insects, and then rocks and dirt, and then hell the damned and the devil. It's one great chain. Some of them are much more complex than the one you see here. But the basic idea is that once you are born into this world, you're, you're in your place and there's nowhere else to go. That is it. You are in your place. You don't get to jump now, I'm going to try this very quickly, but there is a crisis that happens in the 1500s that begins to change everything. It wasn't quite as bad as this image you see here of piles of dead body, but it, this engraving from the 1500s does give you a sense of the fear of the time. There's three reasons for this crisis of the 1500s. Number one, something called new monarchies. Monarchies, of course, being kings and queens. We see the beginning of very very strong new monarchies. And they start in three places, France, Spain, and England. And we can almost throw Scotland in there. Scotland is creeping into this. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. The Valois family in France after the Hundred Years' War are victorious. Uh, the Spain is the Hapburgs, initially Ferdinand and Isabella. They're the ones that sent Columbus over. Uh, King uh, Charles V, who becomes the most powerful monarch in all of Europe, and then later King Philip II. Just to give you a sense of the power of Charles V, uh, he controlled Spain, the Americas, the Holy Roman Empire, Poland, Germany, Italy, Austria, Netherlands, Hungary, and of course again the Americas. In England, you get the Tudors. Later in Scotland, the Stuarts will also become these new monarchies. They're very powerful kings and queens, much stronger governments, which will mean more taxes on people, more regulations on people, and they're going to be more war. Power feeds on power. So these large monarchies begin to grow. They want to expand, which puts more pressure on food, more pressure on the land, more tax pressure. So living in one of these countries, your life would have become a little harsher, a little worse because of these new monarchies. And we do see a rise in the wars here. Another crisis that we're going to talk about later is the Protestant Reformation. We're going to do a whole lecture on the Protestant Reformation. This is basically when some Christians began to protest the Catholic Church and began to break away. We see this in Germany, we see this in Scotland, we see this in England, we see this in Switzerland. And we'll be talking about this later. But religion was the one thing that gave you security in this world. And now, like a divorce in a family, it is breaking up. And it's a scary And finally, the last one is population rise. Despite harshness of life at this time, Surprisingly, we do indeed see the populations drastically increase. From the late 1400s into the 1600s, we begin to see populations steadily increase. And it is one of the big mysteries in history as to why this happened. We're not really sure. Because um, it shouldn't have happened. 
and yet it does. Two of the reasons we think, and I've said this earlier, is that we think that Europe is finally recovering from the plague, from the Black Death. It took a couple hundred years, but they're recovering finally. The other reason is that the climate we think was getting warmer. The ice, that little ice age was starting to calm down, was starting to warm up, and we're getting better crops. So perhaps that is why. But again, it is one of the mysteries. And it's especially the case in Britain. England, for instance, went from 2 million in the early 1400s to over 4 million by the early 1500s. Um, Scotland, we don't see quite as dramatic of a, a population increase, but we do see an increase. In London, a 400% increase in less than 100 years. We see similar numbers for Edinburgh, by the way, in Scotland. In France, they go from 10 million to 20 million. In Spain, we see, again, a 50% increase. That population rise is going to cause pressure on the land, which means the farming pressures. We're going to see low wages because there's so many people. You don't have to pay people a lot of money for jobs. Food itself is going up. The cost of food, where you live, is going to go up. Uh, we see more diseases because we're living closer together, so we see more epidemics of diseases like smallpox and the plague, and we start seeing more beggars. They use roving poor, if you will. The reason I bring all this up, and we're not going to talk about this today, but there, there needs to be an answer to this. How do you solve these problems? And one of the answers to this is colonization, something that we will talk about in a later lecture. Okay, so I think I've talked more than enough. I've gone a little over an hour, so about the same time as a normal class. So that gives you a, a sense of an overview of life in Europe, and it's very similar to life that we would see in Scotland. Um, so thanks, and uh, check out the other lectures, please.